met a boy named Hugo Cabray. He searched to find a secret message. I need to know what this means. And how that message lit his way. All the way home. Hi, I'm Mike Coleman, video producer of the Soundworks Collection, and today we're joined by the sound team of Martin Scorsese's Oscar-nominated film, Hugo. Joining us today are co-supervising sound editor, Phil Stockton, co-supervising sound editor, Eugene Gertie, and sound re-recording mixer, Tom Fleischman. Well, congratulations and thanks so much for joining us today. So before we talk about Hugo, I wanted to just jump in about the history of this sound team, because there's a great history, I guess, with Tom. You've been with Martin since Raging Bull. Yes. Um, and both of you guys have also been working with Martin, uh, you said since 86? 86? 86 was my first, yeah. Yeah, and you're also, for you, you've been, how, how long have you been working with Martin? Uh, well, we were just saying Last Temptation, I guess, and that's 88, Phil. Yeah. So what can you say of looking back of the history of films you've worked on? Uh, it's terrific. It, it, it's a, you know, just a long collaboration amongst not just me and, and these guys, but also Thelma Scoopmaker, uh, some of the cinematographers, you know. Marty has a tendency to work with people that he trusts and likes, and, and uh, he's, you know, it, I feel blessed to have had such a long association with him. Awesome, so when did you guys first find out about this film? Uh, you just wrapped it here recently in November. Well, um, I heard that he might be doing it and immediately grabbed the book and read it, and. Uh, and the book has practically like a storyboard in it because of the graphic novel part of it. And uh, it just seemed right up his alley. So yeah. We were finaling uh, uh, the, the, the um, episode of uh, Boardwalk Empire when we found out. So what was the pre-production process like for you? What, what do you remember of the pre-production process? Pre-production? Um, yeah. We're not really very involved in that yeah. at all. Yeah. I mean, we... What happens with uh, Eugene and I is that as soon as they're, as soon as they start shooting, really, they'll, they'll, something will come up that Marty will want to hear uh, to get some certain sound effects in, or it's hard. He likes to do sound as we go, so we come on and off and on and off and on and off through the whole process. So we uh, we often start like a year ahead of time and start sometimes recording stuff and, and just, you know, giving them things that they can use. And if there's rough dialogue scenes that they just want to have like a rough mix on or something pre-screening, uh, then they'll send stuff to me and I'll work on it and send it back to them. And they'll call me and they'll say, Yeah, now and again, we'll, we'll you go know, to Tom. We've got this terrible problem with the, with the sound in one scene and see, see what you can do. And so, you know, I'll come in or I'll be, you know, stay at an evening or something and work on a scene and that's usually how I get to first see anything and at some point then uh, Thelma will call me up and say you know come to a screening and then I get to see the movie uh, but I rarely get a script ahead of time. Was there any initial direction that he had given you guys in terms of tone direction that he was you know wanting to push you guys towards? Well he always says I want to hear the dialogue you know that's the first direction I ever get uh, every time. Yeah but I mean I think Eugene and I went to a screening and then um, Marty doesn't usually do spotting sessions where you sit down and go through the whole film, but um, Thelma, the editor, will tell us things that he's asked for and things that she wants and, and we kind of build as we go. But on this one, you actually sat down and, and kind of went through a lot of the film, right? Yeah. Um, they sent me some dailies of uh, the Doberman, Maximilian, they wanted uh, footsteps and dog bar uh, growls and stuff on way early in their shoot. I want to say it was the end of 2010, yeah. uh, say November. And in this particular case, Marty had some very specific ideas of what he wanted the comedy uh, to sound effects to, to be like. So he and I screened um, Playtime by Jacques Tati. He had a print, which was uh, great. and we discussed at length the footsteps of, uh, of the um, station inspector uh, relative to what we were hearing in the Jacques Tati film, which opens up with these insanely crispy, clicky footsteps 
down this corridor. And I leaned over and said, Marty, I think that's the way we should go with, with the inspector. And he was all for that, you know, making it a little over the top. The film opens up with this, this great, you know, uh, like a setup for of Paris of what you're going to be where you're going to be seen living for the next, hmm. you know, hour or two for the film. We didn't uh, see that until yeah, that the was final. <laughs> relatively late in the process, actually. So what what was the uh, I guess what was the atmosphere that they wanted to create for Paris in this time period? It, that wasn't that wasn't a very big uh, issue. Uh, certainly Paris train station interior there, there was concern but exterior um, though they pointed out things it wasn't it wasn't a big concern uh, in music you know Howard score is so magnificent and and it pretty much sells the sells the, the whole thing the, the one thing that they that they you know that they worked on with me on that sequence was the clock at the beginning you know that like you're inside the clock and uh, and then the cars whizzing along, and all those little sound effects, the trains as we go into the station, the little voices of the people going through the corridor, how much steam, how much music. You know, those balances were very important to Marty to get those right. Uh, he didn't want to really play the sound effects too much, but they're in there, you know, uh, and he definitely wanted them. One of the lines, I guess, from the film was, time is everything, and with that, there's all the clocks and all the variations of clocks. Where did you guys even start with trying to create this kind of these textures of the clocks and the constant train station? Yeah, that it was a it was a great challenge. It was you know it's a sound editor's dream to work on little mechanical things, and and certainly the clocks were a big part of that. Um, he gave me some direction that he just wanted each one to be different, and uh, there was a couple of things that I I sketched out and gave to him, and he. He thought that that was a little too brittle or a little too in the range of vo uh, the, the voice, so we changed things. But um, he let, he, he, Marty's really great about, though he's phenomenal about giving direction, he really wants you to, to go and do something on your own. And uh, that I'm grateful for, and it's challenging. So pretty much I, I got to play all by myself and submit things and see what it, it see what stays, what they like. It's a lot of, of you know, sending ideas and them approving them or not, and going back to the drawing board. Where'd you find to, uh, you, you source those sounds from? Well, that's it's kind of funny because there we were really intent on on recording all brand new all new clocks and their mechanisms. And in New York, there's the the New York Life building. Uh, there's a bank in Brooklyn. There's a Marty, in fact, sent me a four-face clock from uh, a museum in Paris that we're all set to go and record. None of these clocks have mechanisms. They're all quartz. <laughs> they will work on a little, um, you know, power pack about this big. So it's really funny that uh, it pretty much came as Marty suggested, whatever I wanted. He, he says, we, you can do whatever you want. There's no, there are no real rules. So that's, that was fun. I just had a lot of recordings of various clocks. I used a lot of individual ticks of various elements that I then would make into a clock repetitively so far. Tom, how did you find that you, you used all these sounds to spread out the room and really build those environments? Well, that was, uh, that was a lot of the, the work went into that. Um, uh, we were mixing in 7.1 format, which uh, was seen in the digital cinemas. Um, and that really allowed us to spread things out more than we were able to in the past. And I love that. Um, so. For example, uh, in the beginning, that big clock at the beginning, there were, there were things coming from all parts of the room, things were moving around. Um, uh, it was a matter of just, you know, taking what Eugene had brought and finding a way to balance it with the music, because the music is also playing through there. And in most cases, I mean, I think there's more music in this film than most of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was saying before that uh, M Marty either scores the film with with needle drops or he hires a composer and scores and in this case Howard Shore just did a you know magnificent score absolutely magnificent score which was so much fun to work with and to blend with the, the way that the score blended with the sound effects was just you know it was great I mean I saw that the train the nightmare train sequence where he finds the, he sees the key on the tracks and then the train falls through the station and I heard the score 
And I thought to myself, how are we ever going to get this score to work with all those sound effects? But when we put it together, it, it just, it, you could hear it all. Howard's amazing that way. He, he's so, you know, creative in, in his scoring, but he also knows where to let go, to knowing that, well, Eugene's probably going to, you know, have some huge, lousy sound here, so why would I spend too much time working on that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's really great. There's a lot of give and take throughout the movie, I think. Phil, how did you find working with uh, John Midgley's uh, production tracks and balancing the music? Well, one of my um, assistant who loaded all the dailies for me, um, came in one day and he said, all I hear from John is another take with that ruddy steam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you've seen the movie, there's steam throughout the train station, just everywhere, in, in Hugo's quarters, down in the bottom, and all those machines make noise. So it, they, uh, Marty and Thelma like to do less ADR than a lot of people. Uh, they prefer, they get very attached to the emotional quality of a reading and then they're just not willing to go back and replace it unless they really have to. So um, I think John did a great job with the conditions that he was presented with. Uh, I usually, there was a selection of mics and part of what I do is just picking what I think is going to work the best. And normally I would lean towards boom mic with then, and then just sort of putting the radio in just for the words and then ducking out of it again and having, you know, running both tracks. And in this case, the, <coughs> excuse me, the boom was often just unusable. So we had to work a lot with the radio mics and uh, then you get the crackle from the clothing and all that stuff. So it was challenging to, to try to um, find stuff that could be heard that didn't have a lot of noise on it and so I, I did a lot of work more than usual I think previous to the mix with Tom of just trying to get rid of crackle and trying to do a little EQ here and there to get rid of the steam and I felt like sometimes there'd be a long scene without a lot of dialogue and then there'd be one line and that line needed to be used so I'd put this huge ramp up uh, slowly up to the point of the line and then back down again but um, there are also a lot of little bursts of steam, so you could sort of use that to your advantage, just have it kind of burst up for the line and go out again. And often that, um, that was the same as the visual, like you'd see the steam and then hear the steam, so it sort of worked. But uh, I think he did a great job, but it, it certainly wasn't the best of conditions, even though a lot of the train station was a studio. Sure it was a challenge for him, and not only the steam, but also in the train station there were hundreds of extras <coughs> milling about. So there was this constant, you know, noise of people moving around, uh, even though they weren't speaking. You could still hear it. Uh, but luckily, you, that's all in the picture. So, you know, that Eugene helps. brings in some foley when you add the music. You add the, you know, the ambient tracks. It all, it all masks that, and uh, that that worked out. Um, I think you probably had more trouble with the steam than I did. Um, uh, I didn't really mind it because it was justified by the picture. You know, if we'd been out in the countryside somewhere, then it really would have been a problem. But uh, with, with the, you know, we had a lot of ambient tracks in the station where that steam was. And even down in the, in the quarters where there were all the gears and everything were running. 
So uh, there was a lot of there were a lot of, lots of ways to hide it, uh, you know, hide the problems. So uh, that it worked out very well, um, particularly in the beginning of the automaton scene when the two kids are in his quarters and they're about to start uh, turning the thing on and they're they're having that conversation and. He's telling her that he thinks it's a message from his father. Those lines were very, very noisy, and they didn't want to loop them. They, you know, they really insisted on using the original performances. So um, uh, we worked very hard to make sure Eugene just spotted in little sound effects of steam where we saw it to sort of justify the noise that was in the track. So we were able to get away with using that. What was the direction that he gave you in terms of the character of the automaton? There was, uh, you, you caught me there. We should uh, probably talk about the servos. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, there was no direction. Um, again, he, he pretty much wanted to, I, I will admit, this is, this is um, not atypical of Marty and Thelma or a lot of directors, but they fell in love with their production track, which was impossible to use because to get this automaton to, automaton to work, it was all modern servo you know, dot matrix printer arms and stuff to manipulate this. And of course it's all over. They should have shot at MOS, but they didn't. Or at least I think they should have shot at MOS <laughs> so I could get all my sound effects in there. And they fell in love with certain sounds that were, were, were difficult to uh, convince them that uh, that's kind of modern sounding. So we really spent a lot of time trying to hide things. But um, that was a whole idea. It took weeks and weeks for me to come up with that stuff just by trial and error of uh, I talked to the gentleman that ran uh, the Ben Franklin Institute, who actually has the automaton, and he told me it made no sound whatsoever. <laughs> and um, and which would make sense. You would figure these like fine jewels, these the interconnecting gears would be so well oiled and, and cut that they would virtually make no noise. But then we have movies and we have sound design, which is thank God for that. <laughs> so it was it was a lot of fun to do that. I had cut the production track for for that stuff and I didn't even, I, I, had, I just had it muted because Eugene and I talked so much about what he had done and, and I saw what he did and we all thought it was great and little by little I was unmuting pieces and putting them back in just. They would ask for something, we were in the mix and we, you know, it was all there. Everything that you saw in the automaton you heard, uh, Eugene had built all of that. But they missed, they still missed their, you know, the original sound of the arm moving across. Yeah, that was the big one. You know, uh, the, he liked the scraping that was on, in the production track, you know, the, uh, the thing scraping along the paper. And, uh, but with that was the sound of this kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. electronic servo that you wouldn't find in a, in a mechanism like that. So we had to, we did a good job we had of to just try and, try and notch out as much of it as we could and, and use it as sparingly as possible just to you know, give them the, uh, the feeling that it was still there uh, without having it interfere with the, you know, uh, the beautiful job of recreating that machine that didn't really exist. I mean, a lot of the internal workings on there was CGI to begin with. It didn't actually have all that stuff. Right. So uh, I remember seeing things in the final print that, you know, I, 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 I guess Somehow you figured out it was going to be there, but I don't remember seeing it early on in the early, you know, stages when we were mixing. Yeah, we added to it as um, as as it, the CGI developed because they, they would change the shots quite often. Where all of a sudden you would still see something moving in the background in one shot in a previous version that wasn't there, and yeah. people kept appearing in the film that weren't there before too. There was a lot of that. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's a shot where there's like one person going by, and suddenly there's 20 people going by. So we were constantly adjusting and updating adjust and adding. I mean, did you find that because of Hugo being the type of film it was uh, that there was a different approach to how he was filmmaking with the, some of the CG elements that he hasn't done in the past? Mm. Well, he's done like the aviator, all the planes and everything. That was pretty much all made up. Um, you know, there's probably, typically I would say he doesn't do a lot of that. Um, you know, a movie like Shutter Island didn't have you know, there's there's backgrounds and but stuff they would like tell that. us what was going to be there. Yeah, I mean they they knew what was going to eventually be there, so they would say, you know, there's going to be people in this shot, or you know, you're going to see the arm doing this, or uh, uh, with the train. You know, uh, there was a shot of the train in the train nightmare train sequence of the train approaching. Um, 
before he jumps down into the into the tracks. I guess that was at the end. Yeah. Well, you know, at the very end when the automaton gets thrown up in the air and lands on the tracks and he rescues it. Uh, there was a shot of the train coming into the station that they were trying to recreate the, the movie of the train coming into the station and they they were working on it and we never really knew how close the train was going to be so you know I kind of mixed it like they told me it's going to be farther away than what you see and I had to you know sort of guess at that uh, and luckily it worked out pretty well I didn't have to really change that too much. Did, were you guys delivered a, a, a locked edit or was it progression all progression. throughout? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's never completely locked until the very end. Um, yeah. We the, Usually the way, it, this was sort of typical of the way Marty and Thelma work. They, they take as, every opportunity to just go as long as they can. And, um, you know, we get, we just basically have to count backwards in weeks from where the mix begins and um, act accordingly. But um, like for me, I had, I had people conforming tracks while we were mixing pretty much to the end. Hmm. And I mean it is the nature of the beast with, with, with CGI. Even Thelma would be frustrated and she would get a version of, of a, an image and we would all work to it and then the next thing um, Rob would send another, another version of that that was totally different and um, which is understandable in his world but uh, it, it's, it's pretty much was constantly changing. Um, even like what I was saying that the when I was um, screening the printmaster out here, I guess Q, um, QCing the printmaster, I noticed the uh, automaton had a something in his belly that was a totally different <laughs> image than what I cut to, and it was completely out of sync. But I th think they fixed that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think they got it before it, it, it went to you know out the door. Yeah, so let's talk about the gala scene. There's a lot going on. It's kind of the accumulation of all these films in the story. Right. How did well, you guys it's approach a very this? Emotional, that's at a very emotional point in the movie. Um, and they did a 3D thing there where, where he kind of comes out. Uh, there's another shot earlier in the film where the station inspector's head comes out into the audience. And um, I, tr I was kind of experimenting with 7.1. And I wanted to try seeing if we could pull the dialogue out off the screen the same way that the character was coming out off the screen and um, so that's one thing the other thing was the the clips the clips of the old films the old George Melies films uh, were scored with a temp score and this is another situation where they they had fallen in love with the temp score and when the actual score came in it was a little things with instrumentation was a little bit different and Howard had to work pretty hard to get that you know, he had to keep, he had to redo a few things in order to get that working uh, the way that they, that they wanted it to be. There were, you know, these big drums and when the train goes off the mountain, there's some big timpani hits that uh, we struggled with a little bit. But eventually, you know, it, uh, Howard is amazing. You know, he'll, he'll keep going back and he'll just redo it and redo it until he gets it right. He was, yeah. he was uh, troubled because the, f there were, they, the film was not very close to locked when he had to begin. He had he had 80 musicians and studio time booked, and it was sort of like he just had to record. And Howard doesn't like to have edits in his music, if at all possible. So he was doing a lot of rewrites um, just to, to avoid edits. Like a scene would go from a five-minute scene to a two-minute scene, and he'd have to collapse everything. So he often would re-record things and then the performances would be slightly different. And then, um, you know, it, that's where the work came in. It was to try to get the new performance to match the old performance, not hear the edits. And, and because of the, you know, because of the importance of the music in that sequence, because to them that was sort of the, the emotional pinnacle of the film, they were really particular about, you know, how, how it was to play. Um, and uh, I think we, you know, I think we kind of nailed it in the end. It, it, the dialogue thing worked out to some degree. I, I have a few reservations about that, but uh, uh, I loved what, you know, what we wound up with with the old clips. Had you mixed in the 7 -1 format before? No, this was the first time I had, I had, that's why I was kind of experimenting to see, you know, what I could get away with. 
Um, I think with the station inspector, when his head comes out off the screen, that worked great. I'm not quite sure I you know, did, as, did as well with, uh, with the end. What about with the 3D aspect of this film? Kind of throwing a curveball into everything. The 3D? Yeah. Well, we, we, we didn't work in 3D in the studio. Um, we had screened the film in 3D before we started, and so we knew what to expect. It's really less of a deal than yeah. one would think. I mean, it, you're, try, you're always trying to spread the sound out, and, and if, if you know something's coming out, then you try to you know, bring it out towards the back. But beyond that, it, it wasn't really so much of, a, of an issue. It's more a visual thing. And I mean, from my point sound. of view, you know, we've used surround speakers for decades, you know, so we've really been mixing in 3D all along. Um, so I, I didn't really see it as that, you know, and there weren't very many of those sort of gimmicky 3D moments that in this film. Uh, I thought the use of the 3D was, was pretty great with sort of taking the audience into the picture instead of trying to have the picture come out, except in those couple of places. Uh, so those were the ones where I was, you know, uh, kind of finding my footing with it. Yeah, we didn't have any bullets whizzing by over your head yeah. in this one. I think there was one shot of the the, uh, the wrench falls out of the, the clock and you know hits the ground. But that's up down. That yeah. wasn't even past you. <laughs> yeah, it didn't really. Um, which I thought was great that they both Bobby and Marty the way they they made this film visually is it just it's amazing. They seemingly put a lot of thought into how it would look in 3D. So. So the shots are really Yeah, there's a little beautiful. trial and error at the beginning from what I understand too. They they shot stuff in a way that they thought would work and they had to kind of redo a few things just till they till they really got it. A lot of testing and What about the there's this great little cafe band that's playing in these little aspects of it. What's the story be behind that? Well that uh, that was Howard. Howard wrote all that music. You know, that it was based on Well it's the, Django Reinhardt. Is yeah. the guitar player definitely and and well that's who it's supposed Stephen to be Stefan Grappelli. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's what they were simulating yeah. without. I mean, there was all kinds of you know character references there. Obviously, uh, Django Reinhardt. You know, when they run outside the cafe, uh, Salvador Dali and James Joyce are sitting at the table together. Um, and you either catch it or you don't. It's just, just little brief you know moments. real quick references like that. But we didn't really pay too much attention to that sound wise. It was just you know it's there in the movie. There, there was one thing, though. I remember Thelma saying that of, in the entire production track in the movie, Marty loved the very end of that shot where he says, carry on, the station inspector, after he kicks the... Uh -huh. And there seems to be some, some sound effect on, on the production track that he was in love with, and that was pointed out to us to, to protect. But we played around a little. I, um, I wound up recording a bass player um, and uh, doing some flubbing of strings and stuff, and that that worked out. Yeah. We, we got that in there. He, he went with that. We tried stuff with the accordion. That didn't that didn't, didn't pass so muster. Well. <laughs> Took away from the comedy of it. But uh. what about the first time we we see the uh, studio and we're introduced to this space and they start going into the work that was done on these films? That was um, you know that was a, a, obviously there's a lot of sound effects, there's a lot of music, and there's a lot of dialogue in those sequences, and that's one of those you know really quintessential Scorsese montage sequences that uh, I've always loved about his films where uh, at any given moment there's something that's important to hear. You know whether it's a little bit of dialogue or something in the music or a sound effect. Uh, I, I, at one point the little boy who's telling the story, uh, you know, he comes in and uh, George Melies comes over and says something to him. And it was like Marty just said, take everything out, you know. And we were doing the M&E track without the production track. And all of a sudden, you know, I get to that and everything goes away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go, oh, I hope we can get away with this in foreign countries. But, it, you know, in, in our track, it, it, it just sort of focused you in on, on what, uh, what that character was saying to the boy, which was very important. Was there a, a detailed attention from him or you guys in terms of being authentic, or was it an open... Sandbox. Well, the cameras, the you know, the cranking cameras were. You worked on that yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, we got them recorded up at Eastman uh, in Rochester. Most of the, but a lot of the sound effects in there were production effects, like the sound of the, you know, the big dragon, the, the steam. I guess you added to that, but there was, there was production effects there from that. The music was, was not score. That music was Eric Satie piano piece. I don't remember the name of it. 
and uh, the waters of Minnetonka, which is another you know piano piece, uh, ragtime or pia uh, piano roll kind of thing, um, which was sort of cross faded and comes in and out and. Uh, yeah, that's something they did pretty early on because Howard also scored that and they were so in love with what they already had that it ended up going, yeah, it ended started. up staying with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, You were saying the Brian Selznick uh, book that this is based off of, actually you said it was like a storyboard, so mm -hmm. obviously the films that we're referencing in the film, there's no sound. Yeah. So right. what yeah. did you find that it, it was giving you, what, what type of direction? This didn't make sense to anybody, um, it seemed at the time, but there was a reference in Brian's book about the lights of Paris and the world being um, all intertwined. And uh, Rob Legato and, and Marty had developed this idea, this visual, um, to, to, and we used it two places in the movie. And that, there were references in the book to that, that idea of, these, of this being uh, all part of one big mechanism. And that was very, difficult because we went through a lot of different versions visually of what that was going to be. Yeah, that kept changing. I mean that opening clock um, that Tom was referring to that we played with in 7-1. Turns into the Arc de Triomphe. I worked on that for two months when it was a single clock moving and that turned into people and then the people started to disperse. It was really cool but apparently they couldn't get that to work in, visu in, 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 in visual so they, they changed it and then there was a lot of changing there. That, that went on. Yeah, on. There's, there's two sequences where that clock at the beginning turns into the Arc de Triomphe and you see all the cars spinning yeah. and then it goes over to the train station. And then later on when the two kids are up in the clock tower looking out, you see that same image of the of the Arc de Triomphe which then turns into a clock, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you're back into it a nightmare. Yeah, that's a funny that's a funny sequence actually in the sense that when I Again, with very little direction, I saw that as, you know, photons and electrons and entering, just starting to enter this age out of mechanics into somewhat modern. And, we, and so I, I, I approached it that way. And when Marty first heard it, they weren't in love with it. They, they were like, eh, you know, maybe this, but not that. And sure enough, like after seeing it a half a dozen times, I went and changed some things and they said, no, 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 we liked it that way, <laughs> the way that it was the first time. So it's funny how that developed. It was... Um, you know, it was it was just developed through you know different ways of figuring out what are we going to do here, and then they decided they'd rather go with the. How would you describe the, the team's shorthand with the history you guys have, and you kind of <laughs> you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses. Uh, we do don't even talk. We, we you know. <laughs> Eugene and I were speaking last <laughs> night in a bar mm -hmm. and uh, talking about how we cannot have a conversation that doesn't have a reference that leads to a reference that leads to a reference from some film we've worked on because after. 20 some odd years it just sort of becomes that and we we don't even we could have a whole conversation that no one would even understand what we were talking about other than us so and Tom's in on a lot of that too but a lot all of the, most of the time Tom's Eugene and I are carrying on Tom goes what yeah. what are you guys talking about <laughs> we but, have to stop you know, and explain we, you, you're right there is shorthand that Tom and I have worked together on a number of films and I'm sitting right next to him with my effects tracks on the Pro Tools and there's a lot of things we, we he knows what I'm doing and vice versa. It's it's been a while. Yeah, and we same with us. Tom and I always premix the dialogue together, and you know, it'll, Tom will just start to scoot or I got it, I got it. We just the, kind of you know. Yeah, he tries to edit now and again. We yeah. try to mix. And we try to mix. So. <laughs> <laughs> what about the translation of the work you guys are doing here on you know a great stage, uh, and then carrying through to the theaters? Do you guys go to the theaters? Do you? Like yeah. to see your work on the big screen? Yeah. Uh, I, I usually go see it, hopefully in a good theater. Uh, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we can't, we have no control over what happens once it leaves us. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, deficient systems out in the world. People are watching movies on their iPhones and their iPads and earbuds and little plug-in speakers. And you don't never know how it's going to, you know, but hopefully... Um, what I try and do is is just get the balances right in the best environment that I can that I can, and we make you know for different versions we make minor adjustments to that. But but I find that if you know if if the room I'm working in is is properly set up, uh, things do translate to different formats pretty well. Um, you just have to be careful that I mean this is really all about telling a story so. I see a lot of films that 
you can't hear the dialogue, you, you know, everything is sort of a, a mush, there's so much in there that, that it all becomes, you can't discern much. Um, and particularly with dialogue, I think it's very important that, you know, that's the first, like I said, that's the first direction Marty gives me on every movie. Tom, I want to hear the dialogue, you know. They speak, I want to hear it. Yep. So, uh, I make sure that that happens and if, you know, that, that, that requires really working it and being careful of how, how things are balanced. Um, Is that something that comes with experience or working with a great team or both? Well, it, I think it's, the, the, the team is great. I mean, it, it, we work together. It's like we, we, we almost can finish each other's sentences at this point. Uh, like Phil was just saying, you know, I'll say, there's a little, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about, I got it. For Tom, um, he's an expert at being able to, it's like the, the music cue has to go out just here and the, right as this word is coming in and it almost seems impossible and he always pulls it off. So that's definitely his forte. And after this many films, we, they're always gonna want that. We know what they're gonna ask for. And uh, sometimes it's really, really difficult. And it, yeah. it's like, I wanna hear the music here, but I don't wanna miss the words. Yeah. And the sound effects are great, so we have to hear them. And I mean, Tom has one weaving. of the hardest jobs in the sense that there are sometimes two source cues and score and a running line of you know, dialogue that has to somehow all get in there to Marty's liking, which is, is really amazing. <laughs> and Thelma, um, Schoonmaker, the editor, uh, does, they do their own temp mixes and experiment a lot with stuff. So by the time it gets to us, um, they have a pretty good roadmap of what they want. And, um, and then when we're back to having the original production tracks and all the new stuff that they haven't heard yet, it's a real process to try to keep the integrity of what they did and what they're used to and to still make it sound fuller, bigger, and um, and with more stuff, just more of everything. What is it that you guys are most excited about with this film? I mean, it's, it's excited to be nominated. That's always a great feeling. But for you guys personally, what's, what is it that you're most proud of with this project? Uh, I don't know. Well, I'll say that it, uh, when I first saw this film, it just hit me on an emotional level like very few films ever did. I can think of, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. It's in that category. So I loved working on this movie. The way that everything sort of came together at the end, it was, it was at times a real struggle. We were, you know, we were working long hours, and you know, there were times where things got real testy, and we we're ready to kill each other. But in the end, you know, the, the movie is what it's about. It's about getting that story out there, and the way that people responded to it when it came out, the feedback that I got personally from people that, you know, out of the blue, would just say, "Wow, you know, what a great job! You know, what a great film." Uh, that was very gratifying. You know? well, for you, Eugene? I would say just the opportunity to wor work on a, on a film that had it, the, the sound effects and sound design, you know, was, was integral to the story and the script. That's, that's always a real treat, you know, and I'm um, happy to have been part of that team that, that got to do that. And for you, Phil? Uh, it's kind of the same thing, just the opportunity. It, it, um, working with Marty is, is always a real pleasure. It's usually challenging. That it, The film doesn't get finished until it gets finished. We're going right up to the end, and usually the closer we get to the deadlines, um, the, the, um, the more work piles on. And I guess for me, I'm kind of the guy who organizes everything and tries to keep feeding the mix at all times and just Whenever I can do that and pull it off, I sleep very well at night, and that's that is gratifying. It's a good thing to sleep well at night. Yes, it is. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to know. You, so you're going to edit this down to one minute, right? This thing, okay. You're going to have to cut away a whole mess. I <laughs> got <laughs> a bunch of cameras. <laughs> well, congratulations again on this nomination, and thanks so much for talking with us. And thank you. Thank you. Very exciting.